grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The part of God's word for our special consideration this day is written for us in Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He called to him, Abraham. Abraham answered, I am here. God said, now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains there, the one to which I direct you. Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, along with Isaac, his son. Abraham split the wood for the burnt offering. Then he set out to go to the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go on over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and loaded it on Isaac, his son. He took the fire pot and the knife in his hand. The two of them went on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, I am here, my son. He said, Here are the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them went on together. They came to the place that God had told him about. Abraham built the altar there. He arranged the wood, tied up Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham said, I am here. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham looked around and saw that behind him there was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. So it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. This is the word of God. <clears throat> Dear friends in Christ, one red strand, that's what at least used to be woven into every single inch of every rope used in the British Royal Navy. One red thread running through the entire thing so that you couldn't get it out without unraveling the whole thing. So anywhere you cut one of these ropes, whether it was from their, their thinnest heaving line to the, to the thickest hawser, it had that one red string going through it. And anywhere you cut it, you could know that that rope is something that belongs to the British Royal Navy. That belongs to the crown. This is something that belongs to His Majesty or, his, or Her Majesty's Royal Fleet. In a similar way, there is one red strand that goes through the entirety of the sacred scripture. You can cut God's book, good book anywhere you want, and you will see that one same red strand throughout. The blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. One red strand from, from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, to Revelation chapter 22, verse 21, the Bible is, as God says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The whole thing. The whole Bible. The Old Testament too. From the very first promise there in those beginning chapters, chapters to our great, 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 however far you have to go back, grandparents, Adam and Eve, that there was a Savior coming. A savior born of woman who would crush the devil with his foot. This savior was on the way and all the way to the end of the Old Testament. The very last chapter in the Old Testament is the prophet Malachi who's privileged to show this one coming who is to be the son of righteousness. With warmth and healing in his wings, that picture of that blood-bought forgiveness, that warming forgiveness of God, as warming as the the morning sun brings light and warmth into the new day. All throughout, it's that one red strand, that one single promise of the Savior, that blood-bought forgiveness that runs through the entire account that we call the Bible. 
We see that this morning in this account of a father sacrificing a son. Now, a sacrifice that at first glance makes us think this cannot possibly right, be right. This cannot possibly be God. This cannot be possibly God, a good God, asking this. I mean, I know it's a test. It says right here in the first words, God tested Abraham. And I know God does that a lot. He tests people. Never testing them to find out something, to get information so he can know something more. But always testing for us and for our benefit and so we can know something more. And I know most of us can understand the benefit of certain kinds of tests and testing. I mean, I mean in, in school, okay, that there's something beneficial about those tests and exams that go on in school. Or, or the, the tests, the physical testing that some jobs require as, as part of their position. And we can probably understand that the reason most of our vehicles can be so reliable is because of all the, the really vigorous testing that goes into the planning and the design of, of, of those vehicles. But we're not always quite as sure if God's testings are so worthwhile and so productive and so beneficial, are we? Especially when they come to us personally. I mean, God's tests are always pop quizzes, aren't they? They're always unannounced. They're, they're never when we expect them, and they're always harder than we think they're going to be. But we know they come, and they do help us, in a way, evaluate our faith and evaluate our God's promises, don't they? Even if that test means suffering some debilitating illness or injury, or that testing means having to go out without a loved one, or if it might mean super stress and, and frustration in a, in a job or in a, in a relationship, or it might mean suffering some kind of persecution or loss because we stand up for certain kinds of beliefs. I mean, I suppose if we could step outside of ourselves and outside of our situation, we could imagine how, how those testings could benefit someone, maybe even us, how they could move someone closer to God and build up a person's prayer life and, and actually strengthen a person's faith, but I don't know. Now, Abram had had tests from God before. Some of them he passed with flying colors. Some of them he failed miserably. But each time he got stronger and closer to God because of that testing in his life. But none of those tests before were like this one. Way back then, before they had Greenpeace or animal rights activists, I know there were people that were already starting to worship animals in certain cultures and societies. But before they had those kinds of rights, God had told his people he wanted them to offer him sacrifices. And all of them, like everything else, including the tests, all of them have that same pattern of God and his word and his testings. They all have that same pattern of, of showing how serious sin really is, but then showing also how loving he really is and how he goes about saving people. And all of them pointed to that one red strand, that one string, that one line of the substitute sacrifice that was coming. But this sacrifice, can this even be right? Abraham, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering. And each word of that phrase had to be like one more bang, clanging of that, tolling of that, that bell and just drive into Abraham even more how much he dearly loved his son. Your son. Your only son only son, that one you waited until you were 100 years old before you could actually hold him in your hands and see him with your eyes. That son of the promise, connected to all the promises of salvation, Isaac, the one that means he laughs, the one who brought joy and happiness into your life. And if this test doesn't make any sense to us, think how this man Abraham must have felt. I mean, He's being asked to set aside every bit of logic, every bit of emotion, 
He's to sacrifice his son, his only son. How, how, how even, just from God's way of doing things, how even could Isaac's descendants ever occupy this promised land? How could the Savior come from one of Isaac's descendants if Isaac wasn't going to have any descendants, if he was going to get killed by his dad before he even had a single child? And God had specifically said that the promise was going to run through this one. Through Isaac, it would be the link all the way to the Savior, meaning that if Abraham loses this son, he's seemingly losing also the promise of salvation. And if what God was asking Abraham to do was pummeling his brain, his logic and his reason like that, just imagine what it was doing to his heart and his emotions. I mean, parents have had to say goodbye to grown-up loved ones as they go off to war before not knowing whether they're going to make it back or not. And I know parents have lost children to death before, and so they might have some idea of what Abraham was going through. But I don't think I could have handled it. I think most of us would have argued with God, right? First of all, I would have been defensive. Wait, 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 you couldn't have said it what I thought you said. Uh, I'll, I'll wait till tomorrow, and if you say it again, then maybe I'll think about it. Or maybe we would have gotten more defiant. Are you kidding me? No way. That's crazy. I'm not going to do that. I don't care what you say. Now, you and I have answered like that to God from tests that are not even anywhere near as close to being this tough. But Abraham doesn't. He gets on it right away. We're even specifically told, and it's really exaggerated in the original how early he gets up the next day, that he gets right on it. He's told this in a dream at night, and the first thing in the morning he gets up now, some of the church fathers teach that so he didn't have to run into Sarah and didn't have to explain anything to him, to her, before he had to leave with her son. But he left first thing in the morning to do what God had asked him to do. No hesitation at all. He had no idea why God was asking him to do this, only that God was asking him to do this. And he had no idea while, how God was going to work all this out without breaking any of his promises, but still he believed and he trusted and he obeyed. And it wasn't that he didn't dearly love his son and just said he loved his son. No, God specifically tells us how much he dearly loved his son. But apparently he loved his heavenly father even more. As he got up early, chopped all the firewood, loaded it on the donkey, got the pot with the hot coals in for the fire, got a couple of his servants and his son, Isaac, and went to that place God had told him to go. And just think of the, of the trip there. This is a, this is a good three-day walk to get from where he was to Moriah. Every step had to be just agonizingly painful. Each one closer to the point where he was going to have to kill his son. And so much time to, to agonize, to think things through, to, to, to maybe turn back. But he doesn't turn back. He's going to do what God has asked him to do. And, and he still has confidence that, that God is somehow going to make happen what he had promised was going to happen no matter what goes on on that mountain. That somehow God would have to bring Isaac back. I mean, you kind of hear it, right, when he's talking to the servants. Did you catch that when he's telling them, you guys stay here with the donkey? The boy and I are going up there to worship, and we will come back to you. We will return to you. And it wasn't just like bluster or, or bluffing. It, it, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, This man who received the promises was ready to offer his only son, about whom it was said, Through Isaac your offspring will be traced. He reasoned that God also had the ability to raise him from the dead. Overriding everything, his heart and his mind were shouting at him, he goes through with this. He, he trusts in God enough to go through with this. And, and it gets even harder as he goes up the mountain, as, as the son starts to talk to him. And Isaac asks that just dagger in the heart question, right? Well, Dad, here's the fire, here's the, the, the wood. Where, where's, the, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? That trust that led Abraham to do the ultimate. And and apparently, Isaac is the same way, right? He's going along with this. And I suppose that shouldn't be too surprising to realize that as the little one said to the Sunday school teacher's answer, well, well, why do you love God so much? And she said, well, I guess it just runs in the family. That just ran in Isaac's family, didn't it? 
he grew up with that faith and that love of God that, that follows God no matter what the brain says, no matter what the heart says. We don't even hear of him struggling at all. And he was full grown at this time. And his dad's well over 100 years old. He could have gotten out of there if he wanted to. But anyways, back to his dad. He collects the rocks, the stones, and puts them into that altar. Puts that firewood on top. And he knew that there wouldn't be any trees there. But I would have waited to cut the firewood. I wouldn't have brought it along. Oh, shoot. There's no firewood. Sorry, God. But he doesn't. He stacks it all up. He gets it all ready. And, and then I can hardly bear to look at this as, as he ties his son up to keep him from wiggling around on the altar. And he gets that butcher knife in his hand and he pulls it back. And, and I'm picturing like in that Rembrandt painting, if you've ever seen it, where Abraham's got his hand over Isaac's eyes with his head tipped back so his throat is exposed. And he's got his hand way up there so, so he can just get through on that one clean chop. And I can hardly comprehend this. It's, it's so hard to understand. Isn't it for you too? One time uh, Katie asked her, that's Martin Luther's wife, asked, she, she was so bothered. She had been reading through God's word and came across this account. And it bothered her so much she burst into Luther's uh, study. And it was like, I, I, I don't get it. I just can't understand how could God ask Abraham to sacrifice his own son? And Luther had to say, well, Katie, if that's true, then how can we understand that God should give his own son into death for us? And I think we've gotten through close enough to the middle to be able to see that red strand here. It's not about the sacrifice of Isaac, who never did get sacrificed it's about the God who was not held back from sacrificing his own son for all of us. See, right when Abraham got at the point when he was going to carry through with slaying his son, he was stopped by the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, it's a messenger of God. And we realize from God's word that that was God himself. It's the second person of the triune God. This is the incarnate son of God, pre-incarnate son of God, before he's before he's Jesus, before he's conceived in the womb of the virgin, before he gets born in Bethlehem 2,000 years later, the, the one who later in John chapter 8 was going to say, your father Abraham was glad to see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. And it made the people that he was talking to want to kill him for claiming to be God. And eventually they did kill him. God's one and only son who died on that same exact mountain, just a, a stone's throw away from, from where he had held back from having Abraham kill his son. The test is over. Isaac lives another day. Abraham gets his son and, and the promise of God intact, that promise that through this one, a descendant was coming in which all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That one constant strand through all God's word and all God's promises. Jesus. Because there was still a sacrifice. Little did Abraham realize it when he was telling his son, well, God will provide the lamb. But when he turned around, there it was. He didn't have to track it. He didn't have to stock it. He didn't even have to catch it. It was stuck there by its horns in the bush. And, and all he, it's on a platter for him. And so verse 13 says, Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And that one little word, instead, turns our attention away from Isaac to the ram. The sacrifice that God provided in place of Abraham's son, Isaac. And of course, to the infinitely greater sacrifice that would occur 2,000 years later. Yet yeah, Abraham was spared the trauma of having to slay his son, having his one and only son put to death but the Heavenly Father was not spared. For this time, there was no other way. This was the only way. For our sins, we were to be slaughtered. And only the knife and the fire, that was going to be the eternal death and the fires of everything we deserve for all of our thoughts and words and actions that go against the Almighty God's will. And yet, our Heavenly Father provided the substitute sacrifice. He offered up his one and only son, the son he loves perfectly, more than any of us could love our own children. In fact, he loves our children even more than any of us could love our own children. So I can understand Abraham's love for Isaac. I have children. 
but I cannot begin to comprehend the depth of my Heavenly Father's love who offered up His Son as our substitute. But I don't have to comprehend it, and you don't have to understand it. God only asks us to believe it and to rejoice and to truly live because of it for now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now have the opportunity to confess the Christian faith we share. We do that this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. Would you please stand as you are able? <clears throat> we believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. 